Named after the Carrera Pan American road race, Porsche's Panamera is the brand's offering to luxury segment buyers who want spacious rear seat accommodation and a properly sporting Gran Turismo driving experience. This model could have ended up being a four-door version of the company's 911 Coupe or a low-slung interpretation of the Mark's Cayenne luxury SUV. In the event, it's very much its own car, a long, low, five-door hatch that offers something very different in its sector. This revitalized version of the Mark II model not only looks a little smarter, but also offers a fresh electrified PHEV option and an uber-powerful performance flagship variant. Whatever your preference, for boardroom buyers who yearn for a brand's hatch, this car promises to be a tempting proposition. Porsche makes sports cars. And some of them look like this, like its predecessor. This second generation Panamera, first launched in 2017, sets out to be more than simply another powerfully performing luxury segment saloon. It's a machine created instead around the uncompromising sports car principles that so characterize its brand and the design now enhanced in this much improved form. To understand this car, you have to understand the way that Porsche sees it. Now, this contender may be priced against Mercedes S-Class luxury saloons, but ever since the Mark 1 model's original launch back in 2009, its role in life has been styled to be subtly different. The brand sees the Panamera as a Gran Turismo, the kind of car that allows two rear-seated passengers to recline in comfort while the driver enjoys himself. Forget Audi A8s and BMW 7 Series models. Think instead about faster versions of the Audi A7 or the Mercedes CLS, perhaps a Maserati Quattroporte, or even the old Aston Martin Rapide. In other words, uh, it's a four-door luxury conveyance to really get the pulses racing. This car won't be chauffeur-driven. It shouldn't be anyway. It would, after all, be such a shame to ignore all this Panamera's dynamic attributes and merely treat it as a limo. Porsche seems to agree, uh, and that is perhaps why we can no longer have the lengthened executive body shape in our market. So, body style choice is now restricted to uh, either this standard sports saloon body shape that we're trying here, which, uh, as you can see, is actually a five-door hatch, or alternatively, the more practical Sport Turismo body variant, and that's a kind of shooting brake style sports estate, which offers a little extra carriage space and the option of taking a third person in the rear. Whatever your Panamera preference, you'll find this now exclusively petrol-powered model line much improved as a result of a package of updates announced in the autumn of 2020. Now that brought sharper looks and a series of handling, media and safety enhancements, as well as a higher output and even more addictive aural fireworks for traditional derivatives like the V8 bi-turbo Panamera GTS we're going to try here in this test, which now offers 480 PS and which sits below the even faster variant that now tops the conventional part of the lineup, the Turbo S with 630 PS. These days, in our market though, up to 70% of Panamera sales are of the PHEV plug-in hybrid versions. So Porsche has concentrated much of the update budget on them, improving battery range and adding in a fresh 4S e-hybrid derivative. And that sits between the base 4 e-hybrid and the top Turbo S e-hybrid models. Lots to talk about then, but does the Panamera still have a credible role to play in a Porsche lineup which is increasingly focused towards full electric models like the comparably priced Taycan? Well, time to subject this car to the industry's most comprehensive test and find out. Porsche's priority at present is electrification. It's the main thing that the company wants to talk about with the revised version of this second generation Panamera. PHEV model sales being crucial to this Gran Turismo contender's continued survival. But 
The brand is still keen to reassure customers who are unconvinced by various forms of battery motion that, for the time being anyway, Zuffenhausen will continue to bring them versions of its cars with old-school combustion power plants mated to the company's latest technology. And here is one of those, the glorious 4-litre by Turbo V8 that this car shares with top versions of the Cayenne SUV. More power has been teased from it as part of this Mark II Panamera model's midterm update. 20 PS more in the case of the GTS variant we're trying here, which today puts out 480 PS and now sounds even more emotive, as you're about to hear. Power up, and that's what you get. Now, if this kind of politically incorrect orchestral display might generate a few too many disapproving stares in the boardroom car park, and then one of the uh, PHEV Panamera variants will suit you better. Those models feature a battery system, and that'll start you silently in full electric mode. We know which one we'd rather have. To some extent, really clever engineering can defy the laws of physics. If you want proof, here it is in the metal. Now the first generation Panamera handled quite impressively for a model of its kind, but when we tried this uh, second generation version 971 series model back in 2017, we felt it was far closer to being the kind of car that Porsche always wanted to make in this segment. And so it is with the revised version of that Mark II model. Now yes, you really feel this GT model's prodigious size in town or on tight twisting B roads. It is after all more than five meters long and nearly 2.2 meters wide. On faster flowing routes though, thanks to fantastic steering and an astonishing lack of body roll, this two ton four seat luxury segment contender feels almost as agile as a Porsche 911. Or at least it does when it's specified with all the brand's expensive dynamic drive technology. Uh, there's a lot of it. Adaptive anti-roll bars, PTV torque vectoring, and the rear axle steering system are amongst the highlights. PASM adaptive damping is standard, but most Panamera customers embellish that with the optional air suspension setup if that isn't already standard. Virtually all of these features have been subtly reworked for this updated range, which gets improvements to grip and traction, courtesy of tweaks to the steering and better optimized tire compounds. As before, all of this sits on the high-tech MSB platform that Porsche was charged with developing for super luxury sector Volkswagen Group models. Uh, you're going to want to know about the engine changes made to this revised model, uh, before which a quick reminder on Panamera power plant hierarchy, uh, that might be in order. Now when we first tested this um, second generation car back in 2017, the variant that we tried was a diesel and that seems pretty strange to remember now because black pump fueled engines were discarded by Zuffenhausen shortly afterwards, never to return. That leaves the lineup fundamentally based around just two petrol engines. Uh, each are wedded to the brand's usual eight speed twin clutch PDK automatic gearbox with its steering wheel paddle shifters. Now these power plants, uh, they're basically the ones that this second generation design has had right from the beginning, uh, either a 2.9 litre V6 or the bi-turbo four litre V8, which as I mentioned earlier, we're trying here. Of course though, there are plenty of variations in each case. Uh, some of them new as part of the work Porsche has done on these powertrains as part of this facelift. Uh, choice with the V6 still kicks off with a base entry point Panamera model. Uh, it's only offered with a standard sports saloon body style and it's the only variant in the entire range not to feature the four wheel drive system that many customers in this part of the range do want. Hence the availability of an alternative Panamera 4 derivative. Either way, that V6 engine develops 330 PS. Uh, that unit also comes in 440 PS guys in the faster Panamera 4S. And that's a worthwhile upgrade because it sees the base version's 5.6 second 0 to 62 sprint and 168 miles an hour top speed improved to 4.3 seconds and 183 miles an hour in the S. 
If you're a typical customer though, it's more likely that you'll be wanting a Panamera with one of the available plug-in powertrains. Uh, for PHEV folk, that V6 comes mated to a 136 PS electric motor, developing a system output of 462 PS in the base Panamera 4E hybrid, or 560 PS in the freshly added mid-range 4SE hybrid variant. Again, there's a worthwhile performance upgrade with the faster model, the base PHEV versions 4.4 second 0 to 63 sprint figure and 174 miles an hour top speed is improved to 3.7 seconds and 185 miles an hour in the S. With both V6 plug-in hybrid Panameras, uh, the use of a now larger 17.9 kilowatt hour lithium ion battery has significantly increased the potential all-electric driving range to over 33 miles. That's provided you master use of no fewer than six driving modes e-power, hybrid auto, uh, e-hold and e-charge. Uh, those options join the usual Sport and Sport Plus settings. Very well healed hybrid customers who want more power can opt instead to have the hybrid system plumbed into the brand's familiar 4-litre by Turbo V8. The resulting powertrain in the flagship Turbo S e-hybrid model uh, that develops a stonking 700 PS and that makes that variant the most powerful car in Porsche's entire model lineup. The hybrid system's extra weight, uh, 300 kilos, means it can't be the fastest of course, but 62 from rest still flashes by in just 3.2 seconds on the way to 196 miles an hour. Like all PHEV Panameras, uh, this one's electric top speed is 87 miles an hour. Uh, that V8 is also offered in two more conventional non-electrified forms, one of which, as we said earlier, uh, we're trying here, the 480 PS Panamera GTS. This model's performance stats rest to 62 in 3.9 seconds en route to 186 miles an hour should satisfy those who would previously have chosen a Panamera Turbo. Uh, that variant has been replaced by the considerably faster Panamera Turbo S which boasts 630 PS and improves those performance stats to 3.1 seconds and 196 miles an hour. That, if you've been paying attention, makes uh, the Turbo S marginally the fastest Panamera model in the range, and that's a status confirmed by the Nürburgring Nordschleife Racetrack Executive Cars Class lap record of 7 minutes 29.81 seconds, if you're interested. Now, basically, uh, whichever V8 Panamera you choose, it'll be ballistically fast, capable of generating G-forces denied to just about any other car that we can think of with four luxurious seats. Uh, the kickdown performance is genuinely shocking and it's all delivered to the accompaniment of a menacing growl. Whatever your Panamera variant of choice, if you're minded to get the most from it, a fair bit of option box ticking will be required. A good starting point being the PDCC Sport Adaptive Anti-Roll Bar System, which uh, further limits cornering body roll to a level that really does feel sports car-like. Uh, packaged up with that is the PTV Plus Porsche Torque Vectoring Plus system, uh, which quells understeer and wheel spin through tight corners and which locks a differential for extra traction when you're accelerating out of a bend. Even more aggressive cornering agility can be delivered by the rear axle steering system that we've been trying here, that at higher speeds sees the rear wheels uh, steer slightly in the same direction as those at the front. As a bonus, at under 31 miles an hour, uh, the same setup moves the rear wheels in the opposite direction from those at the front to aid awkward manoeuvring. If budget permits, you'll want the ideal suspension setup too. A revamped version of the brand's PASM, uh, adaptive damping setup, that's standard, but most Panamera customers embellish that with the optional air suspended system, which features as standard further up the range and which offers lift, medium and low ride height options. Uh, you're likely to be heavily persuaded towards specifying that three-chamber air suspension setup by your local Porsche Center if your Panamera variant of choice doesn't already have it, but it is really worth going along with that because that system really does enable you to change the character of this car over its three available modes. It's cosseting in normal, but it's firmly purposeful if you go for Sport or Sport Plus. Another feature that the vast majority of Panamera customers tend to go for is the Sport Chrono package, which gives you launch control for F1 style getaways, and that'll take a couple of tenths off the acceleration sprint times. 
As part of the deal, you also get a center dash stopwatch and a rotary dial on the steering wheel for selecting between the various drive modes that we touched on earlier. Uh, in the absence of PHEV techers here, uh, there are three. They're badged the same as those for suspension travel. Uh, switch between normal, sport and sport plus and as you'd expect, uh, you'll alter your throttle response, your steering feel, the stability control thresholds and the reactions of that 8-speed PDK Auto gearbox. An extra drive mode individual option allows you to tailor things to suit your own personal preferences. Plus, the Sport Chrono package also gives you a central sport response button on this uh, mode selection dial. Press that and for 20 seconds you get a short blast of engine response which will be useful for tight overtaking manoeuvres. All of those systems that we just mentioned coordinate together with Porsche's uh, 4D chassis control central network system which continually oversees every aspect of drive dynamics a bit like the conductor of an orchestra. Whatever engine you choose, you're going to want to enjoy its aural fireworks and to do that you're going to need the optional sports exhaust system that comes as standard on this GTS variant. Now without it, the sound and fury from beneath the bonnet there doesn't really fully make it into the cabin. If budget permits on non-turbo models, you might also want to specify expensive PCCB Porsche ceramic composite brakes. Uh, that'll make stopping in this Panamera even more arresting uh, than the frantic acceleration. Um, you'll need them for repeated circuit use, but if you're driving at speeds that would justify them on the public road, then you might as well just drive over to the local police station and hand yourself in. Shut your eyes and picture what a four-door Porsche 911 Sports Coupe might be like and you won't be a million miles away from the reality of this Panamera. The old pre-2017 first generation 970 series version of this car set out to deliver on that brief too but never quite managed it. It was sleek from some angles but it was distinctly awkward from others. Everyone seems to be agreed that this 971 era second generation model is a much more stylish piece of work thanks to its longer wheelbase and its lowered rear roof line. So much so that Porsche wasn't minded to make too many visual changes as part of this mid-term facelift. Now we're going to get to those after we've taken a moment to better appreciate what's on offer here. Now for this test we've chosen the standard body shape, uh, the alternative to which is the almost identically sized Sport Turismo shooting brake estate. Porsche no longer offers our market uh, the long wheelbase hatch based executive badged variant which in other markets features an extra 150 millimeters between the axles nearly all of which goes towards lengthening the rear part of the cabin for boardroom level folk. So what will you notice on first acquaintance with the Panamera? Well the raised profile of the front wings is a brand trademark but it can't in this case be matched by the kind of flat bonnet that you get in one of the company's sports cars because in this case of course uh, the engine has to be in the front hence the power bulge there. As ever, this model takes luxury saloon segment conventionality and puts it through the paper shredder. After all, cars of this kind aren't supposed to be hatchbacks, nor in standard form are they supposed to only seat four. Uh, this one, though, thinks differently, just as Porsche hopes its buyers will. Many of those people will probably be folk who liked the pre-2017 Mark I 970 series original version of this model uh, because at first glance this second generation design seems to be only lightly evolved from that earlier predecessor. Take a second look though and the differences might begin to become clearer. In profile this lower rear flyline roof contour really does give this Panamera something of the silhouette of a sports car and that's an impression aided by the 911 like side window styling and the way that the front wheels have been moved right forward. Now they sit in flared housings ahead of a vertical uh, air exhaust port that forms the starting point for upper and lower creases that flow back into the heavily sculpted flanks. 
The rims are now larger, at least 19 inches in size, with even bigger 21-inch sport design alloys fitted here. Brake caliper colour helps in identifying the variant in question. Uh, it's black on the Panamera and Panamera 4, red on this GTS, acid green on the e-hybrids and yellow with the PCCB calipers of the top turbo models. Move to the front and if you owned the original version of this Mark II model, you might pick up on some of the detailed changes that Porsche has made to this updated model. All variants get the previously optional sport design front end styling pack, uh, which delivers these more striking air intake grills, large side cooling openings and the single bar front light module. Otherwise, things are as before. This arrow-shaped bonnet features twin creases, which emphasize the central power dome and flow down into the sleek nose section with its deep radiator grille. The piercing LED headlamps just above can be optionally ordered with the Matrix technology we've been trying here. Uh, that sees 109 piercing LEDs continually adapting themselves to surrounding vehicles and current road conditions, and that's based on current driving and navigation data. Move to the rear and the sports car queues continue. Rivals have to embellish boring bodywork with flares and spoilers to try to achieve proper GT status, but on a Panamera, that simply isn't necessary. The rear shoulders are broad and powerful, the coupe contours are sleek, and you can't even see the rear wing, which, as with the previous model, sits uh, seamlessly integrated into the tailgate when the car's at rest and automatically deploys at over 56 miles an hour to aid high-speed stability. Uh, the restyled uh, three-dimensional LED rear lamp clusters, which now feature, have darkened lenses with this GTS variant, and on all Panameras are connected by this narrow illuminated strip, also restyled, and there to help to create a unique nighttime signature. Lower down, this potent diffuser incorporates twin tailpipes at each corner, offering another way for Porsche enthusiasts to identify the model you've chosen. They're round on mainstream variants, including the GTS version's sports exhaust that we have here, and trapezoidal in shape on the top turbo models. As usual, of course, uh, what matters more is the stuff you can't see. The stiff and sophisticated MSB platform that's shared with Bentley, which sees much of the body structure fashioned from lightweight aluminium. Time to take a seat inside this Porsche sports car that also happens to be a super luxury saloon. You appreciate the implications of this curious combination almost immediately. The low slung seating layout with its perfect positioning and almost infinite adjustability really is quite similar to a 911's, while the tall centre console that runs down the middle of the cabin here hems you comfortably in fighter aircraft cockpit style. Uh, virtually nothing has changed with this facelifted version of the Mark II model. There is a redesigned multifunction sports steering wheel, that's about it. Uh, otherwise, uh, everything is as before, which means that you'll be struck by what the brand calls the digitalization of this cabin. Now, your first feel for that comes with the twist of this unusual starter control, which brings this shiny piano black console around the gear stick rather startlingly into life with a range of touch-sensitive icons, which were designed to replace all the pre-2017 first-generation models' fiddly little buttons. It certainly all looks smart, but as with other such minimalistic setups we've tried, it's quite hard to find your target by touch. Plus, the surface uh, quickly attracts dust and smears. Just above lies the other defining feature of this cabin, the huge 12.3-inch colour touchscreen controlling the standard Porsche communication management infotainment system. Uh, initially, its functionality can seem pretty daunting with all the media and connectivity menus joined by a drive section in which you have to choose your drive mode, uh, your chassis setting, your air spring height, uh, plus your exhaust and your rear spoiler options. There is pinch and swipe technology and crystal clear graphics that only Mercedes can match, but it is annoying uh, that it doesn't come with the kind of separate iDrive style controller down by the gear stick here that some other rivals do include. Now that will be a problem if, like us, you struggle to get to grips with voice control. Now, Porsche says that its voice pilot setup has been improved. 
it can operate the climate system, for example, but we still find a response to some other commands to be frustratingly patchy. So operating screen icons are still the easiest way to get what you want. Shortcut media, home, drive and climate buttons lower down the central stack certainly help to more easily access the system's functionality. But once you've activated them, you often still have to stab away at the touch screen to try to find what you want. It all means that in driving this Panamera and using its features, you can very often find yourself taking your eyes away from the road more often than might be ideal, either to access something on this central screen here or to find a switch on this lower black panel. Of course, that will probably be less of an issue once you're more familiar with the car. Porsche now offers the option of a head-up display, but that's pretty expensive, so it's most likely that you'll be referring to key driving data via this wide instrument binnacle. Now, at first glance, this seems to deliver the classic five-dial display, which has characterised some of Porsche's iconic previous models, but closer inspection reveals that the only actual conventional gauge on offer is a central rev counter. This is surrounded by seven-inch sized virtual screens on each side that can be configured to represent the extra dials and which are activated by rotary controllers on the steering wheel. Uh, the speed and assist display on the left, uh, that doesn't tell you very much, uh, that's really vital apart from how fast you're going. But with the car and info screen on the right, there's considerably more to see. Uh, scrolling through the options allows you to view trip computer readouts, uh, along with tyre pressure, all-wheel drive system, and even G-force readings, are all shown alongside an analogue clock. There is also a navigation option with mapping, and that can take up the whole of the right-hand section of the binnacle, and an optional night view infrared display, that can feature here too. What else? Uh, well, these sports seats are brilliantly supportive. There's a choice of 8-way, 14-way, or as in this case, 18-way adjustment. And the classic three-spoke steering wheel feels great in your hands, especially in this GT Sport Alcantara trimmed form. It's also easier to place this car than you might think, thanks to the way that you can view the front wings and the bonnet, uh, the power dome on that, especially from this low-slung perch. Choose the Sport Chrono option, you'll get this lovely uh, dash top mounted stopwatch too. Problems? Well, they're restricted to a few minor niggles. This cheap feeling drive mode controller dial on the steering wheel, for example, uh, that simply doesn't fit with cabin quality, which otherwise easily justifies a six figure sum. Uh, there is also the issue that this central air vent here has to be controlled from the touchscreen just above it, which is such a fiddly process that you just end up not bothering with it. Uh, this screen can be slow to find data, and cabin storage could be better too. Uh, there's no upper compartment for your sunglasses. Uh, there is relatively restricted space in the glove box and in the door pockets. There is a small fold-out compartment just below the gear stick here, and behind that there's this central section which flows back towards the rear, and that provides uh, front seat folk with dual cup holders and a lidded box incorporating aux in and 12 volt ports and a USB point two. That's now of the USB-C variety. Let's try the back. Uh, the long rear doors open wide and in a nice touch, they pull out on fully adjustable stays. With these, the door isn't only restrained at defined points, but instead can be held precisely at the angle at which it was opened. More importantly, thanks to this second generation model's low set stance, access to the back isn't as compromised as we expected it might be, given the relatively low rear roof height and the curvaceous coupe-like styling. Now, should you go for the Sports Turismo Shooting Brake Estate model, uh, this is even less of a concern, of course, thanks to that body style's elongated roof and higher window line. Settle in here and immediately you feel a bit more special than you would in rival models, thanks to these two individual sport seats that replace the usual bench. You can also add in an optional small two plus one central rear seat that could be used for a child. As you can see, we've got that here. Uh, the main outer seats aren't the compromised pews that you expect to find in something uh, professing to be a four-door sports car. Instead, they offer standards of leg and knee room, really not far off the kind of thing that you get in a similarly priced Mercedes S-Class or a BMW 7 Series saloon. 
As for headroom uh, across the range, well, you actually get exactly the same as was on offer in the pre-2017 Mark I era version of this car. And that's despite this second generation Panamera's lower roofline. Of course, ultimately things aren't quite as spacious as you get in a boxier rival limo-like model, but to our eyes, various compensations more than make up for that. For a start, the seats here are positioned a little more centrally than those ahead, so you get an unexpectedly decent view of the action going on up front. Another advantage to this layout is the way that it allows space for this big central console, optionally incorporating a 4.6 inch colour infotainment touchscreen similar to the one provided on the dash. Uh, getting that screen fitted doesn't make it possible to connect to the internet or to access web-based services, uh, a film on Netflix for example. For that you'll have to pay extra for the twin seat back removable screens supplied as part of the pricey rear seat infotainment system. Um, you can though use the fixed central monitor to access navigation, climate control and multimedia systems and to activate the massaging seat function if that's been fitted. Further back, a narrow lidded compartment incorporates two cup holders and can take up to three USB-C points, although again, there's a shiny piano black surface that'll mark up easily. Just above, uh, there's a fold-down armrest, plus if you feel the need for privacy, you can add in optional electric side and rear sun blinds. As for luggage space, well, if like us you approach this car expecting that its hatchback configuration would mean a class leadingly large boot, then you might be a touch disappointed here. Uh, click the key fob button for the standard power operated tailgate. It's optionally operable by foot gesture and you'll find that uh, most models offer a shallow shaped 495 litre capacity. That's slightly down on what you'll get from a conventional boot of a S-Class or a 7 Series. Plus there's a high loading lip to negotiate and that's degraded by a shiny metal sill plate which will easily scratch. There's no underfloor space to speak of either uh, despite the fact that Porsche declines to offer any sort of standard spare wheel. Perhaps though we're being overly critical. The 40-20-40 rear seat back split offers the advantage that long items like skis can be poked through into the cabin without disturbing passengers. And of course the uh, hatch configuration of a Panamera is far more flexible than that of a saloon could ever be. Apart from an Audi A7 Sportback, no other car in this class can drop its rear seats and take, say, a couple of small mountain bikes in the way that this Porsche can. With everything flat, a massive 1334 litres of space is available in most standard variants. Go for the Sport Turismo estate model and a slightly larger 515 litre boot can be converted into a 1384 litre total loading area. With uh, all body styles, you'll have to bear in mind the caveat that some engine choices will slightly limit the luggage capacity figures that we just mentioned. Uh, with the top turbo models, incorporation of that upgraded Bose sound system, well that means that the hatch version has a 467 litre boot and a 1306 litre total capacity or 487 litres and 1356 in the Sport Turismo variant. With the A-hybrid models, they need to incorporate the batteries which drive the petrol electric system, means that those figures fall further to 403 litres and 1,242 in the hatch, or 418 litres and 1,287 litres in the Sport Turismo. Panamera pricing varies widely based on engine, body shape and degree of electrification. Plus, of course, you'll have to show considerable restraint with options unless you have bottomless pockets. In short, it's easy for costings here to spiral upwards unless you choose carefully. So we'll try to guide you through what's available here. Uh, in theory, Panamera pricing based on figures applicable at the time of this test in early 2021 starts at around £70,000, but that only gets you the rear-driven base V6 Panamera variant that few customers want, partly because it only comes as a hatch. 
A more realistic price starting point for the range is found with the Panamera 4, which uses the same 330 PS version of the 2.9 litre V6 engine and includes the four-wheel drive system that from this point in the range is standard fit. Uh, also from this point on in the lineup, there's the option of the Sport Turismo shooting brake style estate body shape. Now that usually commands a £2,150 premium over the equivalent hatch. It's hard not to see the Panamera 4 as the sweet spot in the lineup because from this point on, things get really quite pricey. Porsche demands nearly £20,000 more to get the 4S model, which features the same 2.9-litre V6 engine in a 440 PS state of tune. It seems quite a markup for a software change. For some reason, the markup to get the 4S in Sport Turismo form is much higher too. But for most Panamera customers, all of that will be fairly irrelevant because they'll be restricting their perusal of the range to one of the three e-hybrid PHEV models, which account for up to 70% of sales in our market. Now, at the time of this uh, facelifted Mark II model's launch, pricing for those started at around £84,000 for the V6 Panamera 4 e-hybrid with 462 PS. Again, there's a big markup, this time around £18,000 to get the same engine in S-Trim, which with the V6 PHEV sees it in an uprated 560 PS state of tune in the Panamera 4S e-hybrid variant. That's an increment that might cause you to take a pause before automatically signing up for S model ownership. If you come in search of the top V8 powered Panamera Turbo SE hybrid flagship variant, uh, budgetary considerations won't be unduly troubling you. Uh, that derivative will set you back a cool £140,000. That leaves only the two remaining conventional non-electrified V8 models, the 480 PS GTS variant that we're trying here, uh, which from launch was priced from around £107,000, and the Turbo S, which from launch had a sticker price of around £137,000. So much for the range detail. What about the value proposition on offer here? Well, your view on that will depend to some extent on how much you agree with Porsche's assertion that there's nothing quite like a Panamera. Now, in some ways, they're right. Uh, if you happen to be interested in the Sport Turismo estate version of this car, then there isn't any other luxury segment model that even attempts to provide anything that's similar. Uh, for comparative purposes, though, uh, our focus here is going to be on this standard hatch body style. Now, this is a car that the brand describes as its Gran Turismo in an effort to try to set it apart from the top luxury saloons that you would naturally consider to be obvious rivals. At this point, it's hard to ignore the fact that the brand sells another similarly sized but very different Gran Turismo style model in this segment, the Taycan Full EV, although that car's a four-door saloon. If you're considering a PHEV Panamera, it's entirely possible that you might be cross-shopping between these two models, in which case uh, you'll be really interested to know that a base V6 Panamera 4E hybrid costs much the same as an equivalent Taycan 4S while a top V8 Panamera Turbo SE hybrid costs much the same as a top Taycan Turbo S, all of which is presumably not coincidental. Assuming you don't want a full EV though, what other rival models in the luxury segment most closely approach what Porsche is trying to offer here? Well, certainly there's nothing else in this part of the market which has quite the same performance focus, which has always been a part of Porsche's DNA. Plenty of cars come close though, uh, so just for a minute or two, let's consider a few of them. Now, since the majority of Panamera customers will want a PHEV derivative, our focus here should probably be on rivals which also offer that technology. If you're considering a spend of around £85,000 on a base Panamera 4 e-hybrid, you could save around 20000 by choosing an Audi A7 Sportback S5 TFSIE, around 7000 by choosing a BMW 745e, and around 2000 by choosing an Audi A8 60 TFSIE. But none of these three luxury PHEVs would really give you the same level of exclusivity. Now for that, uh, you'll need something like the Mercedes S580e, but that luxury PHEV would cost you significantly more. Also at this, uh, around this price point, the Lexus LS500h, uh, that is though a self-charging hybrid, not a plug-in. 
If you don't want a PHEV Panamera and you're seeking similarly priced Gran Turismo style alternatives from other brands, then your options really depend on the part of the range that you're considering. Uh, the base Panamera and Panamera 4 models might be cars that you would stack up against, say, an Audi S7, a Mercedes AMG CLS 63 Formatic Plus, or a BMW 840i Grand Coupe. A Panamera 4S or GTS customer might also be considering, say, an Audi RS7, a Maserati Quattroporte, or conceivably a couple of BMWs, the M5 Competition, or a BMW M850i X-Drive Grand Coupe. Finally, a Panamera Turbo S customer might also be looking at desirable alternatives like the BMW M8 Grand Coupe, the Mercedes-AMG 63e, or a Bentley Flying Spur. Those are all lovely cars, but if you've concluded that this is a better one, then you're going to need to know just how generous Porsche has been with the standard specification. Now, we have mixed feelings here. I mean, is it really justifiable on a car of this price to make buyers pay extra for features like metallic paint, full leather upholstery, privacy glass, uh, a reversing camera, keyless entry, adaptive cruise control and a rear wiper? We think not. Having said that though, it's also true that entry-level Panamera models are a lot better equipped than they used to be. Um, in addition to model-specific features like the PDK automatic gearbox and the uh, electrically adjusting rear spoiler, the kit list also runs to alloy wheels of at least 19 inches in size, automatic full LED headlamps, an electrically powered tailgate, LED tail lamp clusters, uh, tinted heat insulating glass and rain sensitive wipers. There's also a park assist system which will automatically steer you into spaces and PASM, Porsche Active Suspension Management Adaptive Damping. Inside there are electrically adjustable heated seats that are part leather trimmed on the entry level variants, uh, plus you get cruise control and dual zone climate control with pollen and carbon filters. Plus the interior mirror, like the exterior ones, has auto dimming functionality. Uh, the multifunction steering wheel, it has buttons which uh, activate the Porsche communication management uh, infotainment setup. Now that's a 12.3 inch screen which comes complete with navigation, uh, voice control, internet capability, Bluetooth phone connectivity and a 10 speaker 150 watt DAB audio system. There's also an included Connect Plus package. Now that lets you access music through the Apple CarPlay system, although there's no uh, Android Auto access. And uh, Connect Plus also gives you Car Finder and Porsche Vehicle Tracking System Plus services. Now those will uh, let you know where your Panamera is at all times. Via a remote vehicle status feature, you will also be able to check vital data like uh, door locking and fuel range from your phone. Talking of phone connectivity, there's also a range of downloadable bespoke apps available for this car. The main one that you'll be using is the Porsche Connect app, and that works on both Apple and Android phones, and it gives you a wide variety of digital features and services, including a car control feature via which you'll be able to check vital data such as door locking and driving range from your handset. Uh, this Connect app is divided into three main areas. My vehicle for car specific functions, uh, me for user specific services and navigation which allows you to find uh, destinations of almost any kind in seconds. Um, a covered car park, for example, rather than an open one if it's pouring down and you don't want to step out into the rain. Uh, for the e-hybrid variants, uh, there are also specific e-control sections for finding charging stations, uh, setting charging times and preconditioning uh, the cabin climate. Beyond Porsche Connect, uh, there are also a range of further bespoke apps available for this car. Uh, now, we particularly like the Porsche Road Trip app, which helps on long distance journeys. So that's guided you through the standard spec, but of course, as on any Porsche, that's only the start. And as you'd expect, there are plenty of options. So let's start with the dynamic ones. Now, most will want to enjoy the adaptive air suspension, which is optional on the lower level Panameras, but standard on the pricier variants. 
Uh, this system works in conjunction with that standard PASM, adaptive damping setup that we mentioned earlier, and offers normal Sport and Sport Plus chassis settings to vary the ride from cosseting to clinically precise. The other optional dynamic extra that most customers tend to add is the Sport Chrono package that we've been trying here. Now this gives you launch control for F1 style getaways, a dash top stopwatch and a steering wheel mounted mode switch for the various driving settings. In the center of which is a sport response button which will give you a short term blast of engine response which is really useful in overtaking maneuvers. Uh, a head up display is now available too. Going further means adding the PDCC Sport Package, that's the Porsche Dynamic Chassis Control Sport Adaptive Anti-Roll Bar System, which dramatically limits cornering body roll. This setup works in conjunction with the PTV Plus Porsche Torque Vectoring Plus System, which works through the twisty stuff to counter both understeer and wheel spin by lightly micro-braking whichever front wheel is threatening to lose grip. Uh, PTV Plus also delivers a perceptible gain in traction when you're accelerating out of tight bends by locking the differential. We'd want that, uh, possibly in concert with the optional rear axle steering system, which at high speeds sees the rear wheels steer in slightly the same direction as those at the front, uh, while at lower parking level speeds they steer in the opposite direction. Now the result is extra cornering agility at speed and easier manoeuvring when you're parking. Porsche's Power Steering Plus system, now that uh, lightens the steering at parking speeds. That comes with the rear axle steering system or it can be ordered separately. All of these systems that we've just mentioned, uh, they all coordinate together with Porsche's freshly developed 4D chassis control central network system. We would definitely want the sports exhaust system and if you're going to use this car hard and fast, maybe on a track, might also be an idea to fit the ceramic composite brakes that use race car technology to deliver fade-free stopping power every time. We would also want to look at the PDLS Plus headlight package. That's another feature that we've been trying here. And that adds the Porsche dynamic light system with matrix beam technology to the LED headlights. Each lamp cluster contains a total of 109 LEDs which automatically adapt themselves to other road users and to the road conditions. They draw from navigation data as does another tempting electronic option, the brilliantly clever Porsche InnoDrive system. Now that includes adaptive cruise control that's also available as a separate option. Once you've set a navigation destination, then the InnoDrive system constantly looks ahead over the next couple of miles, uh, calculating the optimum acceleration and braking responses that will be needed. And that takes into account uh, corners, roundabouts, inclines, speed limits and traffic flow. It then feeds all this information to the gearbox, the engine and the braking system. Porsche claims that no other brand offers as sophisticated a setup. What else? Well, if like many Panamera customers, you've gone for one of the PHEV e-hybrid models, inevitably more spend is going to be required there. Obviously, with the addition of a charging wall box for your garage, if you don't already have one, uh, now that can be embellished with a bespoke Porsche charging dock. Uh, Porsche can also sell you a freestanding compact charging pedestal. Away from driving and engineering features, there are of course also lots of more comfort orientated options you could add. Uh, the two main ones that we'd look at first are the 4 plus 1 middle seat for the rear bench, which for around £600 more enables you to transport an extra person at the back, and also the more comprehensive four zone climate control system. Now that's an option that gives you a 4.6 inch centre mounted colour touch screen for back seat passengers. Now this particular car also features a cabin air ionizer and a surround view camera system that includes that missing reversing camera. Onto seats and upholstery, there are lots of choices here. You can upgrade the standard comfort seat to a 14-way adjustable one or specify the Sport Seats Plus package we've been trying here with 18-way adjustment. Uh, individual comfort 8-way power adjustable rear seats are available too. Whatever your seat choice, you can add in cooled ventilation and massage systems on request. That's for both front and back seats. And you might want to add decorative stitching and uh, seat centers in contrasting colors. 
Now that brings us on to upholstery. There are two extended leather options uh, which will give you full leather in various colours. The two-tone leather option or softer, more supple club leather. You can extend this leather to cover the dash, the doors and also the instrument binnacle if you wish. Other luxury options include electric steering column adjustment for the steering wheel and that can be heated uh, plus electrically operated blinds for the rear screen and the rear side windows. We have soft closed doors here. Some owners might also want to look at a comfort access package but that will provide keyless opening and entry as well as the option of unlocking and uh, opening the tailgate just by uh, waving your foot under the rear bumper. And you can also add rear privacy glass, auxiliary heating, thermally and noise insulated windows which will keep the cabin cooler and quieter and a panoramic glass roof with an opening front section. Don't forget to leave yourself some budget for upgraded infotainment too. The first step up from the standard audio system is the 14 speaker 710 watt Bose surround sound setup that comes as standard on the turbo models and which uses noise compensation technology to ensure superb clarity. Or you could go all the way and spend over £5,000 on the Burmester high-end 3D surround sound system with 21 speakers, 1,455 watts of power and a sound enhancer to make sure you enjoy the full concert experience. Uh, for those sitting in the back, the Porsche rear seat entertainment pack provides two 10-inch touchscreens. Uh, now they work with a pair of provided Bluetooth headphones and they can be used to watch DVDs and videos through the car's internet connection. Plus, they're also equipped with a camera so that boardroom folk can engage in video calls on the move. A six disc uh, DVD CD auto changer can be added along with rear USB ports. As for other options, well, the majority of these concern interior and exterior aesthetics. And unless you want your Panamera finished in either solid white or black, you're gonna have to pay extra for the paintwork there are a range of metallic options and a series of further special colours. Plus, uh, there's also the Porsche exclusive programme and that can match any bespoke shade that you might want to nominate at a cost. Um, as you'd expect, there's a wide range of optional wheel rim choices with 19, 20 and 21 inch sizes, some with um, coloured finishes and you can have colour coded centres. You might also want to look at the Sport Design Package, which includes a more prominent front apron with C blades around the intakes, plus a rear finisher and diffuser, side skirts, and the number plates around in the same shade as the rest of the exterior. You can have the rear tailpipes finished in black or silver, a tinted finish added to the headlights, and an exclusive design finish for the rear tail lights. The exterior mirrors and door handle inlays can be finished in body colour or black. Uh, the side window trims can be had in silver or black. Uh, the air outlet trims can be finished in body colour or carbon. And the model designation badge work can be finished in black, silver, red, aurum or body colour. Uh, if you're looking to make the cabin of your Panamera more bespoke, you can match the interior trim panels with the exterior colour or you can go for brushed aluminium, alcantara or carbon fibre cabin finishing or perhaps choose from various shades of wood, uh, paldeo grey, dark walnut, amber and anthracite abache. Uh, there's also an ambient lighting package which delivers an exclusive feeling of illumination in different colours for the footwells, the overhead and centre consoles and around the speakers in the doors. Uh, plus you can opt for the safety belts in a complementary shade uh, or in either red or a shade that Porsche calls crayon. Or perhaps you'd prefer the Rev Counter's face or the Sport Chrono stopwatch face in white, beige or red. Uh, you can have aluminium pedals and there's an exclusive design gear selector. Oh, and we'd want the GT Sport steering wheel we've been trying here. The air vent slats can be painted or even trimmed in leather and you can have the Porsche crest embossed on the centre console armrests and or on the seat headrests. The door sill guards, uh, the luggage compartment cover and also the uh, vehicle documentation wallet, they can all additionally be trimmed in stitched leather.
What about the practical stuff? Well, there's all the usual stuff, of course. You could add in a tow bar and the roof crossbars that would let you add the optional racks uh, that are available, which would allow you to transport a roof box and carriers for skis, snowboards and bicycles. Uh, there is a specific rack for racing cycles and you can add a cycle carrier onto the tow bar too. For the luggage area, we'd want the bespoke Porsche luggage set and also the load space management system that includes floor rails, four extra eyelets and a reversible mat. Uh, that latter item is available separately too. A storage package gives you a net in the front footwell and in the boot and you can also specify a fixed luggage compartment cover, uh, a luggage compartment liner, a luggage compartment box and a ski bag. You might also want to tick the boxes for a fire extinguisher, uh, all weather floor mats, indoor or outdoor car covers, snow chains and a footrest at the rear. On to safety. Now given the sophistication of the interior we had expected all manner of camera driven safety tech to be available on this car. Uh, for this updated model the Zuffenhausen maker has added a lane keeping assist package including road sign recognition and there's the brand's PAS or Porsche Active Safe Autonomous Braking System although uh, you have to specify adaptive cruise control to get that. Porsche calls this a collision and brake assist system and it alerts the driver both audibly and visually when it detects possible collisions with other cars or with pedestrians and it activates an emergency stop function when necessary. Uh, the kind of sophisticated self-driving systems that rivals do offer still aren't available for this car which is disappointing. Uh, there are a couple of optional camera features. Uh, lane change assist, now that on the move warns you if you're just about to pull out with another vehicle looming in your blind spot. Uh, that feature also comes with turn assist rear and that alerts you to oncoming traffic when you're reversing out of a space. Of course, all the more conventional stuff is well covered. Every Panamera comes with the POSIP Porsche Side Impact Protection System, which builds in side impact protection elements into the doors and includes thorax airbags integrated onto the side bolsters of each front seat. Uh, there are also full-sized front airbags and knee bags for the driver and front passenger, plus curtain airbags along both sides of the entire roof frame. Further rear side bags are optional. There are of course triple point belts for every seat in the car and that includes the middle person if you've specified that optional 4 plus 1 middle rear seat. Plus both outer rear chairs have ice fix mounts and you can add another at extra cost into the front seat. All models of course feature ABS anti-lock brakes, PSM, Porsche stability management, traction control, uh, tyre pressure monitoring and an active bonnet which will reduce pedestrian injuries if you hit someone. After dark that is less likely if you specify the optional night vision assist system. Now that can detect wayward people or animals before you're likely to see them and highlight them on an image displayed on the dashboard screens. Uh, the optional LED matrix headlights that uh, we mentioned earlier can do the same thing and uh, will specifically illuminate living things that might be about to stray into your path. It's a bit oversimplistic to say that if you really cared about efficiency issues in choosing a Porsche of this kind, then you'd want a Taycan EV instead. And we heard of a Taycan owner recently who took eight hours to complete a two hour trip because they couldn't find an operating public charge point on the journey. That is perhaps an extreme example, but it does illustrate that our country's public charging structure is still way off what it needs to be to make purchase of a full battery power model like the Taycan a no-brainer choice in this segment. If that's also your perception of things and you're seeking a Gran Turismo style Porsche of this kind, but you need to keep an eye on the kind of decent fuel figures and affordable benefit in kind taxation ratings that only electrification can bring, then we think you'll agree with us that the plug-in e-hybrid versions of this Panamera have much to offer, which is why they now account for nearly 70% of this model line sales mix. In our driving experience section we briefed you on the PHEV tech in play here which adds about 300 kilos to the car's curb weight 
Whether you choose V6 or V8 power in your e-hybrid, uh, the engine will be assisted by a 136 PS electric motor driven by a lithium ion battery, uh, the increase in size of which from 14.1 to 17.9 kilowatt hours has done wonders for the all electric driving range. With the pre-facelifted e-hybrid models, Porsche admitted that the real world driving range might be as low as 15 miles. It's hugely better than that now, which in turn has significantly benefited the fantasy fuel and CO2 figures. Uh, we'll run through the WLTP stats for you now and we'll base them on the standard hatch body shape. Obviously the readings will be slightly different with the heavier Sport Turismo body style. For the base V6 Panamera 4E hybrid, there's a 35 mile driving range, a best combined cycle fuel figure of 141.2 mpg and a best CO2 reading of 45 grams per kilometre. Switch to the other V6 PHEV model, the mid-range Panamera 4S e-hybrid, and those stats are only mildly affected. A 33-mile driving range, a best combined fuel figure of 128.4 mpg, and a best CO2 reading of 51 grams per kilometer. With the flagship 700 PS Panamera Turbo S e-hybrid V8 variant, You'd expect to have to pay a little more for your pleasures, uh, but nevertheless, this top derivative still allegedly goes up to 31 miles on a single charge and theoretically records up to 104.6 miles per gallon on the combined cycle and a best of 61 grams per kilometre. Basically then, if your daily commute is no more than about 25 miles in a round trip, it should be possible to run a Panamera e-hybrid without using any fuel at all, providing you charge up every night. If you don't, of course, as with any PHEV, you'll merely be running a much heavier version of a petrol-powered luxury saloon, which means that you'll be lucky to see more than about 25 miles per gallon. To give you a feeling for real-world fuel consumption if you charge properly, we'd suggest that about 80 miles per gallon would be realistic when you're driving with reasonable restraint. The charging time is the same for all three e-hybrid variants, so powering up will take around two and a half hours from an installed wall box or around four hours using a standard household three-pin socket. To get the best range returns from a Panamera e-hybrid, you'll need, of course, to make proactive use of the four extra drive modes provided. Hybrid Auto, that's the default one, and that sees the software deciding the best use of battery and combustion power. E-Power keeps you in battery motion only, providing the charge is there to do it. E-Hold saves the battery charge for urban driving that you might have to do later on in your trip. And E-Charge allows you, rather expensively in terms of fuel consumption, to charge the battery as you drive. It's rather interesting to use all of these, uh, either eking out battery power or replenishing it, but to our eyes, it's a world away from the kind of involving driving experience that the Panamera was originally developed to provide. If you want to get a bit closer to that, then the conventional engines will be your point of focus, but of course, these will be uh, vastly more expensive to run. And that's not least because they lack the kind of mild hybrid tweaking, which is now beginning to feature with obvious segment rivals. There's no diesel drivetrain anymore in a Panamera, so your best bet for conventional powertrain efficiency lies with one of the three uh, 2.9 litre V6 variants. Again, uh, we'll quote figures based on the hatch rather than on the slightly heavier Sport Turismo estate. Uh, the base rear driven Panamera hatch manages a best combined fuel figure of 27.7 miles per gallon and a best CO2 reading of 232 grams per kilometre. Those are figures that fall only fractionally to 27.2 mpg and 235 grams per kilometre if you add the weight of a four wheel drive system to that variant. The alternative Panamera 4S manages up to 27.4 mpg and up to 234 grams per kilometre. As for the two conventional V8 variants, well, this GTS manages up to 23.3 mpg and up to 275 grams per kilometre. The top Turbo S, meanwhile, is supposed to deliver up to 22.1 miles per gallon and up to 289 grams per kilometre. If you get anywhere near those figures and a V8 model in regular use, then you're obviously not using this car as it was meant to be driven and it deserves a better home. I mean, you know where we are. It has to be said that these figures are distinctly mediocre by segment standards. Uh, even though Porsche has done its best to massage them upwards in most ways it can, 
Weight saving courtesy of this Mark II model's aluminium based MSB platform obviously helps, although this car will still tip the scales at well over two tons. Uh, the power plants also coast at a cruise, decoupling themselves from the gearbox until you need them again. And then there's cylinder deactivation technology, which will disable half of the cylinders at low to mid throttle speeds. On top of this, there are active air intake flaps in the front grille that stay shut when you fire up the car to help it get up to operating temperature as quickly as possible. At higher speeds, those vents also close to improve the Panamera's aerodynamic profile. And there's Porsche's inner drive system, which is an optional setup that works with the adaptive cruise control. And it uses information from the sat nav plus radars and a video camera to assess the road ahead. It then feeds data to the gearbox, the engine and the braking system, and it modifies the car's behavior for the terrain and the traffic conditions that it will come across. And it will allow it to progress in the most efficient manner possible, braking earlier for corners, roundabouts and junctions, for example. What else? Uh, well, servicing won't be cheap. Porsche workshop visits never are. So you'll want to know that maintenance intervals across the range are every 20,000 miles or every two years, depending on which comes around soonest. Tires and brake pads, uh, they tend to be particularly expensive. Surprisingly, the company hasn't copied other brands in offering a range of prepaid servicing packages at point of purchase, but dealers do operate a fixed price servicing regime, so you'll always know exactly what work will be carried out and how much it's going to cost. Included as part of the purchase is the usual three-year warranty, although this one laudably doesn't come with any mileage limitations. This package can be extended by either one or two further years on request. Panamera owners also get a three-year breakdown recovery package, a three-year paint warranty, and a 12-year anti-corrosion guarantee. It's also possible to buy an approved used guarantee for cars with less than 125,000 miles on the clock that are under 14 years old. To qualify for that, your vehicle also has to pass a 111-point check. If you buy a hybrid model, then the battery pack comes with its own 60-month, 75,000-mile guarantee. And finally, let's touch on residual values. After a typical three-year, 60,000-mile ownership period, you can expect this car to return almost half of its new price if you opt for a hybrid or a lower petrol power variant. The rest of the range can't quite match that, but you will get back around 41% of your original purchase price if you go for one of the really potent models. And that's a decent showing at the six-figure end of the segment. Insurance, well, that is going to be pricey. Uh, ratings are all set at the top of the shop, Group 50E. The market has always offered very fast, very luxurious, full-sized luxury saloons. Rarely, though, have they been very rewarding to drive. The Panamera has always been different very much in a class of its own for boardroom buyers who don't spend all their lives wafting up and down autobahns. In its earlier forms, it was so nearly a truly great car, so nearly the impressively complete contender that the improved version of this second generation model now is. Of course, we're not blind to its failings. Prices have risen substantially, and that's something that would be easier to stomach had Porsche not been so mean with some aspects of the standard spec and consigned so many important features to the options list. Some still struggle with the styling too and will prefer the kind of conventional luxury saloon that will give you a bigger, deeper boot. Limo-like models of that sort, though, wouldn't see which way this car went on a twisty road, uh, nor are they as practical for leisure use. So the Panamera has come good then, but maybe too late to save itself as a credible long-term model line. For some, the introduction of Porsche's full EV Taycan has confirmed this car's dinosaur status, but others who maybe aren't quite ready to have their lives ruled by a still somewhat flaky public charging infrastructure will now, in the much improved PHEV segments of the Panamera range, perhaps find an ideal combination of old school combustion involvement and futuristic electrified technology. All of which may sound the impending death knell for more conventional, non-electrified versions like the glorious V8 by Turbo GTS variant that we've been trying here. Enjoy them while you can. 
In summary, if you still enjoy driving and you like the way that this contender looks, you'll love the way it rewards you at the wheel. The Panamera is unconventional, it's unique, but best of all, it's a proper Porsche. Thank <laughs> you.